be sure to follow me on Twitter. There you can keep up with all the updates from Comics Explained and talk to me directly. So our previous discussion on the Marvel Cinematic Universe with regards to the pre-20th century seemed to be quite well received. You guys really seemed to enjoy this idea because what it did was fill in the gaps. It made a lot of sense of the things that were going on in relation to the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but that Marvel hadn't really shown us in the films that they had basically explained across different uh, forms of media. But what we were able to do was basically consolidate all this information into one video. And so that's what we're going to do here. But this time, it's going to be a little bit different. With the 19th century, there's a lot of things that go on. There are a lot of things that, that take place, or I guess with the 20th century, there's a lot of things that take place. And so because of that, what we're going to do is we're going to split this into decades. We're going to go with the 19, the late 1920s and the early 1930s. We're going to go with the 1940s and 50s and 60s and so on until we uh, are basically caught up with the events as they're unfolding in the, uh, in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Now, what we do here, again, starting with the late 1920s, is we pick up with, uh, with Steve Rogers. Now, a lot of the information that we're going to be getting here coming from uh, the early 1930s, or I guess the uh, pre-World War II era, and going into World War II are going to come from Captain America First Vengeance, which are basically the comic book tie-ins to the Captain America film. But what we know is that at the end of the 1920s, that Steve Rogers' father had already been killed. He, of course, was a soldier. And Steve Rogers' father being a soldier had really inspired him to become a soldier himself. But more so than that, to basically speak out against uh, any kind of wrongdoings, to really develop this incredible moral compass in terms of what he believes is right and wrong. But again, the problem that's, that's going on here with Steve Rogers is that he's a very uh, a very small child he's a very uh, i guess has a very small stature in relation to where he should be, if that makes any sense. And so what happens here is that Steve Rogers' mother is apparently dying. And so what we do is, again, we jump forward a little bit here, and what we find is that Steve Rogers, again, standing up for what he believes to be right, is uh, in a fight with some some local children or some local uh, kids who apparently run this kind of 10th Street gang, I guess is what it would be in the, in the late 1920s. And of course, what they're telling Steve Rogers is that he has to pay some kind of a toll here. But of course, Steve Rogers turns us down and says he won't have anything to do with it and continues to fight. Now, this is when we see Steve Rogers and Bucky Barnes meet for the first time. And the reason why is because Bucky Barnes basically intervenes on behalf of Steve Rogers and helps to fight off these bullies, which of course they run away. And the two of them uh, begin to shake hands and meet with one another. And Steve Rogers tells us that he's an orphan now, that his mother has already died at this point in time. And so again, this begins to form this close friendship that the two of them will have going into their adulthood and especially in World War II. Now, what we also do is we kind of go back and we jump into the idea of Johann Schmidt and Abraham. Abraham Erskine. Now, what we have to do here is really kind of reference Captain America, the first Avenger. This is really the only information we get here. Now, what we know is that again, with uh, around 1930 or so, that Abraham Erskine began working on the super soldier serum. Now, we don't really know why this had been done. We didn't really know exactly what got him into this. All we know is that he had simply just begun doing it because again, this entire Marvel Cinematic Universe takes place separately from the Earth 616 continuity. And so Abraham Erskine's entire uh, mindset for forming the super Super Soldier Serum and the uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe may very well be entirely different from what we had seen in the Earth 616 continuity. But the fact remains is that by 1930, Abraham Erskine was working on this project. Now, what we also do here is we switch to 1934. And 1934 is when things really begin to pick up for uh, Johann Schmidt as well as uh, Nazi Germany and even going forward into the uh, the Hydra Science Division. And what happens here is there's some kind of a play that's taking place. And with, uh, once this play actually comes to an end, once this opera is over that Johann Schmidt meets with uh, Adolf Hitler and Ernest Kaufmann. Now, Ernest Kaufmann is the uh, head of the Nazi Germany Science Division, or I guess the Special Weapons Division, as it's referred to here. And what happens is Johann Schmidt begins speaking with Adolf Hitler, and what he tells Adolf Hitler is that the old stories, the stories of the old gods, of Thor, of, uh, of Odin, and so on, that these tales of incredible magic and things like that may not necessarily be myths, that there may be truth to this. And so again, Adolf Hitler here seems intrigued by what it is that Johann Schmidt 
Schmidt is saying. And so what he tells Ernest Kaufman is to uh, to basically uh, create time so a meeting can take place between uh, Adolf Hitler and Johann Schmidt. But of course, once Adolf Hitler leaves, Ernst Kaufman turns against Johann Schmidt. He throws him out of the building and tells him never to uh, contact Adolf Hitler again. Otherwise, Ernest Schmidt will have him killed. And so what happens here is that uh, is that Johann Schmidt meets with uh, with Heinrich Himmler, and Heinrich Himmler effectively takes Johann Schmidt under his wing, which makes uh, Johann Schmidt a member of the SS. Now again, what happens here as we continue with this is that ultimately we see that uh, this really kind of comes to a head, the relationship between, or I guess the, the conflict between Johann Schmidt and Ernst Kaufmann, when we see an event taking place called the Night of the Long Knives. Now the Night of the Long Knives was a real world event that took place during, uh, during Nazi Germany. And for those of you guys who don't know about this, the Night of the Long Knives was a situation whereby Germany had the head of the brown coats killed. And what had happened was as Germany, or I guess as a Nazi, the Nazi party was rising to uh, prominence in Nazi Germany. As they were beginning to take over uh, popularity in Germany, what they were doing is they were achieving this by basically uh, strong arming people. That whenever the Nazi party had public speakings, that anyone who came out and spoke against the Nazi party would be thrown out by the brown coats. The brown coats would intimidate businessmen and business businesswomen to supporting Nazi Germany. It was different different situations that were taking place where the brown coats were basically hired thugs. And so once the Nazi party had seized control of Germany, there was no more need for the brown coats. But more so than that, the brown coats were your average men and average women. There were various people here and there. And the problem was that it would have been very, very easy for the brown coats to spur public support against Nazi Germany. And so what would happen is that Nazi Germany would be stuck in this kind of a rock and a hard place. And so what uh, what happened is they had the uh, heads of the brown coats killed and the brown coats were basically uh, non-existent. They kind of fell apart and, and really went away at this point. And so what happens here is Johann Schmidt uses the event of the Night of the Long Knives as an excuse to effectively kill Ernest Kaufman. And of course, he arrives at the home of Ernest Kaufman, telling him that all his comrades are dead. And when Ernest Kaufman is killed, Johann Schmidt takes over the science division. And this ultimately leads to the eventual formation of Hydra in terms of, uh, of the entire Nazi science group. Now, from here, what we also do is uh, we see that Johann Schmidt eventually invades uh, one of the weapons depots or one of the testing grounds for, uh, for Kaufman's former science division. And when he does, he encounters a man named Arnim Zola. And Arnim Zola, again, we know him to be the, uh, I guess, the henchman, so to speak, of, uh, of Johann Schmidt from Captain America, the winner, or Captain America, the first Avenger. But what was happening here is Arnim Zola was working on a kind of exoskeleton suit. He was working on a suit that would allow one man to function as a robot, basically a very early version of what we would later on see as the Iron Man armor. But the idea here was that this person would be able to operate as a battalion, as, a, as Arnim Zola says, rather than a person fighting as one man alongside a multitude of other people, this suit would allow him to take on a whole host of forces by himself. And then if enough people have this armor, they could effectively have a much smaller group of people taking out a much larger group of people. And so what Johann Schmidt says is that all of the uh, the resources, the entire budget of Arnim Zola is going to be focused on this one project. And his goal is to enhance on this project, to make it better, and to also improve it to allow more suits to be made. Now from here, what we do is we jump to 1935. And with 1935, what we see is that Abraham Erskine, who again had previously been working on the uh, super soldier serum, tries to leave Germany. Now, as he's leaving Germany, what we find is that apparently Johann Schmidt has somehow heard about what it was that uh, Abraham Erskine was working on. And so Abraham, Abraham Erskine, as he's hearing about these different laws, the, the rumors of laws that'll be passed against the Jewish people, attempting to leave with his family, realizes that various soldiers have arrived on the train in which they are taking. And the soldiers are, are, are going around with a picture, basically asking anybody, if they've seen this man who is Abraham Erskine. And so what Abraham Erskine does is he tells his wife that nobody else should uh, should suffer on his behalf. And so what happens here is uh, the children, or I guess the uh, the children, the wife and son of uh, Abraham Erskine are sent off to a concentration camp, and Abraham Erskine is uh, taken by Johann Schmidt and forced to basically uh, work, do further work on the super soldier serum, which of course we know will eventually lead into uh, Johann Schmidt becoming the Red Skull when the super soldier serum is used on him. With that being said, this pretty much brings an end to the uh, entire idea of the the 30th or i'm sorry the 1930s this brings an end to the uh, this period of time what we'll do in the next video is we'll pick up with the 1940s and as we get into the 1940s we'll see that once world war ii is kicking off that things will continue to again move at a very fast pace with that being said we're gonna go ahead and bring this video to an end i hope you guys enjoyed it if you did let me know and i will catch you guys later peace